Dear Mr. Evan Bloom, people from the embassy, members of the Polar Club, researchers from different institutes, students, I'm very happy to be here today and uh, to uh, start with our Polar Forum. And I want to thank that we had this good proposal from you to meet this, to do this event. So, from the beginning, we planned so that we introduce at first the club, who we are, what we are doing, and as uh, uh, I am the CEO of the Polar Club, who works almost every day with this subject, then I do this short overview. So, I thought maybe it's interesting for you to uh, to see the structure, or not the structure, but simply organizations who are involved with polar questions. It's so different from the other countries. We are so small, but we manage somehow. We do not have a special polar institute, not the polar ministry, and so on, so on. Even we have only one polar club. I know the bigger countries, they have special club for Antarctic researchers, special for Arctic, and so on. So, Estonian Polar Club was founded in 1984. It means that soon we shall have anniversary, 40 years. 40 years of polar activities, it's quite a lot, actually. And the club, we'd we join the polar researchers, the researchers who work in different institutes, different universities, different towns, and even in different countries. So the next step was that in 1993, Estonian Polar Research Committee was organized by the Academy of Sciences. You will meet with them tomorrow. And they are then experts. Such type of committees are by the academy, several. And uh, uh, they have the representation in international organizations. And they also act as the contact to the European Polar Board. Honestly, half of the members of the commission belong to the Polar Club. But there are also some who have been very active, most active, in international level. And the third one, Estonian uh, Polar Foundation. It was uh, established in 1997. No. It was organized by the club. And the idea was that uh, to raise money and to distribute funds. It means scholarships, grants, mainly support to the young people. This activity has not, it has not big, but still. And, uh, and nowadays we have also changed the, um, the system there, but I talk about it later. As we uh, work by the museum, uh, this logo is actually the old logo of Estonian Maritime Museum. That's why there is at the middle of this ancient ship, not very polar ship. Uh, but it sails in the middle of the world. Arctic is in the north and Antarctic in the south. There are people who be, have worked in both places. So the club was founded on the 1st of December 18, uh, 1984 and at the Estonian Maritime Museum. Uh, the date, why such a date? It was chosen according to the date of uh, signing the Antarctic Treaty, because it was also 1st of December. 
but uh, 1959. And the treaty stopped arguments over the ownership of the Antarctic and declared it to be a continent of peace and science open to all humans. And then the place. Why museum? Usually people ask, why are you by the museum? But when you look back in the 80s, it was Soviet time, when uh, it was impossible to do uh, any kind of organizations by any institute. But by the museum, it was much more easier. The museum already had different clubs. And uh, uh, the director of the museum, Hans Perna, he was very interested in the subject, and he get all the papers and permissions from the Minister of Culture, and so we get to the permission to work. Uh, and as I already said, it joins the people with a common interest in the Arctic and the Antarctic, but who have participated in polar research or related polar activities. So it means it's not simply so that somebody is interested in and you can be the member, it's, you must show that you have done something. So the objectives, uh, bringing together people who have participated in polar research. When we started, then uh, people didn't know actually that there are so many who have worked in Antarctica, because uh, they participated in the Soviet Antarctic expeditions, but through the different institutes. They didn't know that the other from other institute, another person was also there. Yeah, so it started everything uh, from the Antarctic side. Then more and more it's important is introducing and popularizing uh, polar issues to the wider public. Because uh, just in this century, more and more it is necessary uh, to understand how important these polar regions are to the whole world. And uh, this century, it's consulting officials from the ministries about the polar issues because the people who belong to the club, they have the experience. Or if we do not have, then we know who has from other institutes or so. Then cooperation with polar organizations and other countries, it has been from the beginning. Because everybody who has uh, wintered with some other, with colleagues from other countries, they they have contacts, they are friends, they invite them, people are coming, joint events, so a lot of such networking. And also we have such a task that we assist the Estonian Maritime Museum to preserve the history of activities in the Arctic and Antarctic. They have quite a nice collection of photos, items, and uh, yeah books and polar art. Uh, members. So, we, there are not so many of them, over 30, and some foreign members. Foreign members are these with whom we have some special contacts and who has helped us to do some important events. Uh, most of the members are background in research. They have participated in many expeditions, research trips, but there are also others, uh, some who have uh, uh, given, uh, who have helped to organize or just lifted the polar question in another level and who are they still interested in. For example, uh, some documentary filmmakers we have very unique films from Antarctic in the 60s. Artists, artists who through the art try to explain to the people that uh, uh, about the climate change and the footsteps and further on. 
So the presidents of the club, they have been academician Dr. Yuri Martin, Engaut, Velo Park, Andres Tarant. At the moment, we are just in the beginning of the elections. So the next president will be in the end of next month, uh, this month. Uh, here is such a group photo from um, when we celebrated our 10th anniversary. In uh, the middle is the first uh, president, uh, Dr. Yuri Martin. So activities, more and more we do the open events to the public. So polar evenings or polar forums, usually once a month, but not during the summer. But if a very interesting polar ship just arrives to a harbor, you can't say no. So this summer we had three interesting international polar events. Also, what we are doing, we are now issuing polar-related memories. So the next book will be next year. We want to, um, uh, because of our very anniversary, 40 years. And the International Polar Year, it is celebrated everywhere in the world. We also do the exhibitions, events. And also, we belong to the International uh, Polar Museums Network. And it has helped a lot. For example, uh, just talking about the bigger uh, events as Antarctica 2000. Uh, the group of uh, businessmen organized uh, the trip from Thailand to Antarctic just to memorize that 200 years ago all these big discoveries were done and one man from Estonia who was born in Estonia, uh, uh, Fabian Gottlieb von Bellingshausen, uh, was one of the discoverers and he worked in the Russia at that time I will not talk about history. I simply wanted to show on this map what we did. We did different kind of seminars. On the way, long way, from Estonia to Antarctic, we stopped in different countries. And uh, are the members of the Polar Club and the local researchers, we joined them and we introduced Antarctic history, research subjects, and they were in different subjects, really, as... Uh, polar biology, climate change, polar history, and so on. And the ship, what was uh, bought because of this expedition, expedition leader is also the member of the Polar Club, but he's not researcher, he is powerful organizer. Uh, and uh, so here is the picture when they arrived in Antarctica and also more closely where they were and they were very happy to visit the Palmer station uh, and to organize events there in Antarctica also together with these polar stations. Uh, about it we did traveling exhibitions Travelling exhibitions travel around Estonia and to abroad also, and at the exhibitions it's possible to talk more closely about it. Uh, also, we do international events. There are other pictures in Stockholm, in the embassy, where we, we were very much involved with the um, Arctic Council, preparing the documents, preparing the people, the ideas, and we uh, really hoped to be uh, more closely, but now we are more far away. But there in Stockholm, we had the uh, seminar about this subject. Now, one of the closest partners is Norway, with uh, whom we have different projects. Uh, this year also was the Czech Embassy. 
and they offered an exhibition about Franz Josep Land, about discovery of it. If who comes to Thailand, this exhibition is still in the Fat Magret. And we also did the uh, Polar Forum. Here in the first place is Lowry, Professor Lowry Lohanisto, uh, who has worked together with the uh, Czech researchers in, in uh, Svalbard. So we talked about uh, this cooperation. Tara, famous French polar ship, just two weeks before the event just arrived. Lot of interesting projects, a lot of institutes were involved in Tartu also, I know. And we did which together with them a polar forum uh, where it was interesting to know that they want to build a new ship, a new um, polar station, and to work with it in the ice and close to North Pole, 20 years. But okay, we will see. We are interested to participate. Now, a oh, uh, very important subject is involving youth. And it was in 2017, when that was the first uh, polar expedition for Estonian school children. But actually it was so that uh, before it we organized the quiz, the young people from all over the Estonia, they participated. Uh, and uh, finally the five best were chosen. One of them is here in the room just now. I introduce her later. So when you think that one, five people are participating and one is already on the way of polar research, then it's good result. Why so many people uh, and the schools were interested in? Because we said that if you are the best, then you have the possibility to be together with the polar researchers with the real polar expedition. You can read the books and look at the films, but if you really see it, feel it, then it's different. Then you can decide, do I want to continue or I know that I would like only to be far away to the south where it's warm. So the first group and uh, the financing, we get to the finance from uh, the uh, children organizations, but, but then the logo was me too, me too, me, I also want to be the polar researcher. So they have that diplomas. And the, uh, the questions, they were not so easy. You see there are papers, you see you mark. We, it's already the second group and we gave them the, uh, the real documents and the questions were based on this, that they would, uh, would uh, quickly try to find the answers. And they were good. So where we were? Uh, friends in Finland, Finnish uh, uh, research station in Kilpisjärvi. It's such a good place where th uh, the borders of three countries meet. Uh, Finland, uh, Sweden and Norway. So we actually did the program so that we involved all these three. And here are the group of Students, they were already students because when we did this in uh, 2019, then you know what came, the corona, and so further on, we didn't manage to go to the expedition. Here, here are the winners. One of them is also here today. Another one is in Tromsø. So also good result. Mm, and among the organizers, one, uh, the, one is now working in the Ministry of Climate. St. Chellery, you will meet him, I guess, tomorrow. Uh, the projects were different because uh, every student had the possibility to choose what she or he is interested in. 
Uh, we visited also Norwegian Polar Institute, and they did the programs. And we were close to, so close to Antarctic Council. Actually, I have agreed with them that uh, they we let us in and in the, to the Secretariat, and we shall have uh, the introduction. But then the leader said, please do not bring them here. It, we, it was in the March, March, and everything uh, bad things happened before. So we still know, do not know when we can go closer. But you can see they are waiting. They are behind the door. Uh, so now I, it was a very close in, uh, introduction. Uh, and uh, I thought I will not talk about the researchers because there are two researchers who introduce what they have done in more detail. What I only can say is that uh, the activity started more in Antarctica, now it's different, now it's more in Antarctica. And the place where most of the people have done the research work is nowadays is Svalbard. At the moment there are also some hours and, uh, and so on, please. Now I will finish and I asked Janne Kotta, please. Questions and discussions we do later. So very good afternoon from my side and now it's something completely different <laughs> because it's uh, focusing on, uh, on research and I try not to uh, kill you with uh, too many details and uh, sophisticated algorithms but rather give you some overall um, uh, like a feeling of uh, Antarctic research and uh, particularly on uh, seaweed habitats. Um, and then, first I give you a bit of my background, so uh, my name is Jonna Gotta and I'm uh, representing this university we are standing right now. Uh, so we have a Estonian Marine Institute which was established in uh, 1992 and uh, we have an ambition of uh, staying as long as possible, but let's see how long. And obviously marine research did not start uh, by this year. Uh, but we have had uh, many other research institutes uh, and our uh, uh, predecessor. Uh, so it, this institute was more focused on, uh, on fishery scientists, but now we are a bit more um, interdisciplinary. So what we do? So we are currently um, doing a biodiversity monitoring, mapping, modeling. Then uh, we do also environmental impact analysis, remote sensing, fisheries research still, and obviously with a new uh, area of data and analysis, so we have uh, big data management, web map services and applications becoming more and more important in our actions. And then obviously, as we have to solve some societal challenges, then blue economy and aquaculture is also some fields that are super important. And then we also build future scenarios and run some analysis related to these scenarios. Um, as you are well aware, I guess that Estonia does not have any Antarctic uh, research station. So in order to go there, you have to do collaboration with uh, someone. So I was picked up by uh, uh, Chile uh, researchers. Um, so they had a nice uh, sort of institute or center, IDEAL, which sounds cool. But then uh, I also very much like uh, uh, Chilean way of uh, living. So uh, we used to be too workaholic, I believe, um, and it's, it's uh, yeah, so we're working too much. But they have a more balanced way of living, so we have eight hours of work, eight hours of fun, and eight hours of sleep. So normally sleep less and fun more, but nevertheless, uh, they are very motivated and they uh, can uh, deliver. And this is super important, and my, uh, one of the most uh, important collaborators is uh, Nelson Valdivia, you can see his his face on left bottom. And then another thing is also, if you are going to another 
culture, so it's very motivating to learn a new language. So it was, yeah, I started uh, studying Spanish at that time when we started collaboration, and now I'm pretty fluent thanks to this collaboration. And it's not only the um, uh, window to the language, but also window to the culture, so you learn more and uh, understand more how the world is uh, functioning around. And then, not only about these uh, personal backgrounds, but also the Chilean station is located in a very nice place. So it's located in the Antarctic Peninsula, and the station is called uh, Professor Julio Escudero. And, uh, and that's uh, super important for those people interested in seaweeds, because, um, you know, seaweeds are plants and they need uh, light. And you don't have light if the uh, sea is covered all the time by ice. But this peninsula is an uh, area where you have this uh, constant displacement of ice, and that's why that established a very interesting uh, uh, spatial temporal patterns of uh, seaweed habitats. And uh, it's uh, very interesting and important to study them because uh, most of it is still not known. So we are a little bit like in, in an area of Charles Darwin. Uh, then he started to move around different places of the uh, earth to map and understand uh, the biota. So in Antarctica, we do, we do know only very little uh, uh, about the benthic life species, uh, patterns and their changes. But on the other hand, we have this climate change and tremendous shifts that uh, affects us. So one of the most important uh, mission, so to say, or action, what I wanted to do is uh, to do a mapping and modeling of seaweed habitats back there. So. So you can do it different ways. So one possibility is you can go on site. Diving, for example, is a good, good way of collecting the data. And then you can get the very precise information about species and the biomasses, abundances, and all those things. But then you're also interested to see the bigger picture, like a, uh, to see the seascapes. And in order to collect the data about the seascapes, it's better to uh, to use some alternative techniques and the remote sensing is something that can be very valuable because satellites are also flying above Antarctica and if you're lucky and having a uh, clear sky, sometimes it's happening, then you get, get these seamless layers of um, uh, remote sensing signal and then that's, uh, there's a modeling is uh, coming into the play. So, so we collect the data, like a point data in a location where we identify the species and amounts of species, and then we have the satellites that cover our area of interest, the study area, and then we build mathematical models that's basically an equation, uh, translating um, the language of remote sensing to the language of the biota. And then you produce, you make a prediction, you produce basically maps, maps of species, habitats, and all these things. So this is just the station, so it covered, uh, basically we started with uh, King George Island, but we have done the same thing uh, in different other areas as well. And then uh, there are yeah, two alternative ways of collecting the data. So one is a diving, if you want to go to deeper, and in a very shallow area, uh, you can even uh, do some sampling uh, on foot, because it's in the tidal area, and when it's a low tide, you can walk on uh, seaweed habitats. So it's uh, pretty amazing for those who have been only been in a Baltic Sea region where we virtually have no tides. So you can yeah, uh, see underwater life without uh, uh, diving. And then uh, the, uh, in order to do some diving in Antarctica, it's obviously very challenging because it's a very harsh environment. So we always have to do it as a group of three minimum, but more better and uh, have to be really professional how to do it. And then, if you go underwater, this is also something what I'm telling in my lectures, that uh, uh, scientists are not only to producing some um, papers or some indicators or some predictions, but we also have to show how beautiful is underwater life. So you have in Antarctica, you have lots of those species that are only in Antarctica, they're endemic. So you don't have it elsewhere in the world, and that's why they are so valuable. So we can't afford of losing them. Because if we lose these species, we don't have these species anymore. And the, the big problem is that we don't know where are they nowadays. We don't know uh, how much are they. So we only have 
sampled a very few spots, so that was the aim of this expedition, to get a bit more about the peak patterns of these seaweeds. And there was one more interesting question, maybe it's uh, perhaps too much of science, but it shows you a bit like um, what's happening. So very often the biologists or ecologists, when they're doing the sampling, they're using a very small window observation. They're looking too small scales. So this is how scientists are often doing. They put the frame on the bottom, then they collect some samples, and then they analyze it later on. But imagine if re remote sensing window is something like this. So is it possible really to relate these things into this wing easily? Perhaps not, and then you get the very bad correlations. So what we tried to do also in this study, we tried to map uh, underwater habitats at different spatial scales to, to understand what is the best way of doing the research. Because we are in a so short period of time in Antarctica, so we have to get most of it. And these are just, uh, just some interesting uh, and uh, beautiful uh, species you can uh, see underwater while diving in Antarctica. So there are many of those, but I just picked up very few. Um, and then, yes, when we, the expedition lasted about two months, and then we finalized, so it was a farewell picture. So, so it was like a, only, the only fun dive we made, actually. So, um, and the good news is about Antarctica is that the visibility is pretty good, so remote sensing signal actually goes very deep, and you can get uh, uh, lots of interesting information from very deep areas. And, and this picture showing you why infrastructure is very important for research. So this is my um, personal jacuzzi, because if you go uh, outside of the water, it's pretty, pretty cold. And uh, the most important uh, saying in expedition was something like hashtag frio. Frio means cold in Spanish. And then uh, in order to get off your, this uh, dry suit, I had first had to go into a warm water, otherwise just, just chuck, you can't. It's, uh, it's so bloody cold. But uh, even, it doesn't matter if it's a low-tech or high-tech, but infrastructure is important. If you don't have it, you don't have a good research. And then, when we did it, so that was the same thing. Basically, you collect, uh, we use uh, all the existing uh, uh, in-situ data, so then we combine it with this uh, aerial uh, remote sensing uh, information, run a model, and got nice maps. And, uh, and the good news was that the relationships were very, very convincing. So using a different uh, wave, uh, uh, spectral uh, length, length waves, you could uh, predict uh, either biomass of green algae, brown algae, red algae, and even diversity. And diversity is a very interesting thing, because what is a diversity in a remote sensing perspective? So if you get basically remote sensing sh showing you some colors, and if habitat is very heterogeneous, then also signal of remote sensing is very heterogeneous. So basically more heterogeneity in remote sensing signal, more uh, diversity in seascape, and that's translated to higher biodiversity. Um, so we didn't stop there. We also wanted to know a bit more about the processes. So when we were also studying uh, primary production of uh, seaweed habitats, communities, because um, you know primary production is sort of baseline or, or basement of uh, other trophic levels. So more you have the production, the more you have the secondary production. So we uh, did some field measurements of seaweed production, and then we also tried to find if there is some associations with uh, spectral indices, again, remote sensing and seaweed production, and, and we got some good results again. And this is what, because lots of algae has a uh, chloroplast, and if they have more chloroplast, they are having a more intense color, but that also means they are more productive. Um, so why this is important? So we want to predict what's going to happen, and lots of scientists are trying to build a forecast about future. And this is very challenging. So we know more or less uh, uh, what's possibly happening with a global air, or air temperature or, or humidity or cloudiness or maybe some uh, wind patterns. But if you try to translate this information into a seaweed habitats, then it's almost like a mission impossible. So we can use some alternative ways, uh, what's shown uh, in an in a image below. So we're already in a climate change area. 
And if we started to map with this remote sensing every day or every free day or whenever we have a possibility of having a clear sky, underwater habitats, so we more or less know how this is changing in time and space. And then uh, we can classify uh, past years, whether they are sort of normal or they are climate change years. And if you find an averages of these uh, different types of years, you can understand what climate change can do on these underwater habitats and uh, give this message to stakeholders, policymakers and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, as you're already in a so far away land, you have to do something extra. And so I was preparing also three documentaries for Estonian national television so about nature. So those who are more interested in what we did, uh, me and the Chilean colleagues, so you can watch this. It's uh, Ozone um, uh, movies. And um, this is basically it. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Anneli Boska, and I am paleoecologist and ecosystem modeler, working with uh, interactions between vegetation, climate, and people. And one of my kind of hobbies or interests is to look at the possible ways our current climate change could change our vegetation in future. And this is here one of the uh, reproductions from some other modeler, but saying the same thing, uh, that Arctic is specially vulnerable. And we expect that sooner or later there will be a considerable vegetation change. And if you look that uh, Europe looks rather nice and blue, it means that there is a little change that's actually artifact by most of ecosystem models which already believe that there is no tundra vegetation in Northern Europe anyway left over. And that's also kind of highlighting the usual uh, uh, human uh, belief that or uh, kind of recognition that uh, something is going to be missing when looking at nice, big, furry animals. I think everyone in, in this room has heard about uh, problems with polar bears and the fate they are facing quite soon. However, not many people have been thinking about uh, the Arctic or tundra vegetation, which actually faces quite a similar weight. So, but anyway, why a paleoecologist is interested in such things as a future of tundra? And that comes from this picture, uh, being an Estonian paleoecologist, and this is one of the uh, reconstructions of uh, vegetation development during the last 12,000 years in Estonia. And if you are looking at the very bottom of this figure, we actually started from Arctic tundra. That was the first thing, or first vegetation we had directly after uh, Ice Age. And you also notice how quick, quick is the change from this herb, this light blue, blue community, to the dark one, which is boreal forest. And that's something what uh, Estonians can tell to uh, people in northern Scandinavia or in uh, Svalbard, for example, that actually connecting past and future is very important. And we can look it, at it in both ways. We can study past and predict future. We can also look at the present state and think about how we are going to change it, and if we are going to change it. And this is a picture of one of our uh, visits to uh, Northern Lapland and Finnmark, where we are collecting uh, pollen and macrofossils, and studying the present day changes. Uh, some of these traps have been there for 40 years, so long before I started as a scientist. 
And we are very thankful for other people who placed them a long time ago into these very important positions uh, and will now enable us actually to follow what happens with these habitats in uh, northern Scandinavia. This is a map of uh, the monitoring sites we have right now. Uh, there are several placed through northern uh, Finland up to northern Norway and mostly connected with different uh, uh, species distribution uh, limits starting from spruce, pine, birch and ending up with arctic tundra. And we have now quite lately also uh, managed to get some monitoring sites to uh, Swarport specific thanks to Lauri Lanisto putting out our traps and uh, our Norwegian colleagues uh, from Norwegian Polar Institute. And these are the pictures from Svalbard traps. And you see that we have to be thankful to many different uh, foreign uh, colleagues. So it is very much similar to what happens in Antarctica uh, Estonia doesn't have its own Arctic stations, so we are often cooperating with other people. And especially with these traps, we, would, we need to change them every year. And that means that someone has actually to go there every year and physically take the trap and put the new one. And of course, thinking about these thousands of kilometers between Estonia and Svalbard, for example, we can't do this every year. So we are thankful to our colleagues from Estonia, like Tönu Martma, who has been doing that sometimes, and other people who are coming or going to these very far places. Now I would like to talk a little bit about our kind of very recent project, uh, taking up these long-term records from northern Finland and trying to out, uh, look at that as a thinking about the fate of mountain perch forest ecosystem. This is a very special ecosystem in between the tundra and forest vegetation, so it is on the ecotone there. And the birch there is definitely not the usual big and nice and, and a strong tree, but rather a bush-like uh, thing, which grows sometimes well and sometimes not. And the interesting part for us is to see if we really can trace now, in 40 years, that the climate change has produced change in this ecosystem, hopefully, at least logically, would be uh, making it stronger, taking it for the north into tundra, and also making it more prolific. And one of the ways how to uh, uh, study that is to look at the pollen production. Because we know that if some, some species or some organism is doing really well, the reproduction is one of the first obvious things which will be boosted. And that means that for plants, that could be directly visible with pollen. Uh, with other things we have been observing there is a reindeer amount, which is a, is a kind of direct herbivorous predator for uh, birch, and also the moth. Uh, amount, which is another herbivorous predator, and of course climate. And all this comes together in uh, Finnish sub subpolar um, research station at Kevo. And at first we were of course looking at the climate change. And this is also something pr practically every one of you has been reading in some newspaper or other than the Arctic climate change is so much bigger, stronger, and more obvious than the thing which we observe here, or maybe at the lower latitudes. We also take, took a look at the very different climate parameters. You see a lot of them there, and you notice that they all point upwards. 
except maybe the one which actually is looking how many really cold days you have in this environment. And this is, of course, definitely going down. So altogether, what we learned from this is that at least in this area of northern Lapland, we have had a decadal warming about 0.4 degrees. So every 10 years, the mean temperature has been rising approximately nearly half degree during the last 40 years. So it is really considerable warming and should somehow affect the ecosystem there. Uh, we also looked at this different measures of ecosystem well-being. As I explained, we were looking at the pollen, amount of pollen the birch has been producing. And you see that it is totally kind of opposite to our expectations. The amount of pollen birch forests have been producing has, on, has been diminishing, not in a straight line as a climate warming, but still with clear signaling that birch actually is not feeling very well. And the second thing which we looked at was a geometry moth, so the herbivorous insects eating up the birch leaves, and you notice that there is a clear trend upwards. And that's just one species of moth here on this figure. Actually, the bigger thing is that besides this species of moth, last 10 years, we have been observing already another species which is coming into the area due to climate warming. And the third species is just a few hundred kilometers away. So with an, a little increase in climate, we can have not one insect repeatedly eating up the birch forests, but three different species doing that. And the last is reindeer. You see that it is falling, uh, but this is mostly connected to the fact that the governments of these Nordic countries are well aware that the ecosystem is not really feeling well. So one of the ways they try to protect it is to diminish the amount of reindeer. And this we can see from, from this figure. However, in our research, we are not completely sure if this is the best way to go for, uh, for this particular ecosystem. Because these two, reindeer and the moth, are actually competing with each other for food. And if we are diminishing the one, the other one will get more and kind of stronger signal to, uh, to uh, spread. So altogether, we can say that currently, the ecosystem is still there and functioning. However, in uh, future climates, we are not sure what will be happening. And actually, with this present study, we can even not give a direction where to go. We can only warn that we see that that will be more and more endangered with any additional degree adding to the already existing climate warming. Now, this is my last slide, but not the least. Uh, this is, as Katrin pointed out, uh, Arctic has been really popular for many Estonian researchers to study. And I put here a few of the, the one studies I know. And I want to point out that really practically all largest kind of universities in Estonia are in one way or other way involved in studies of Arctic. And also there are very many different kinds of research what you can do and what we are doing right now uh, connected with, with, uh, with development and science in the Arctic. So, thank you so much.
So thank you all uh, very much. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Evan Bloom, um, formerly of the U.S. State Department, but now with the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. Um, this is my first trip to Estonia, much less Tartu. So this is, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me here today. Um, and so, uh, yeah, my, that's my picture at the bottom there, so you know it's, it's supposed to be me. Um, it's, a, it's a great privilege uh, to be here and to be speaking with um, people who I think, uh, I'm sure, uh, share my interest and passion for the, for the polar regions. Um, I have had the privilege of working on both Arctic and Antarctic issues for uh, much of my professional career uh, and have uh, been able to, for the U.S. government, spend a fair amount of time in both polar regions. Um, I was the U.S. head of Antarctic diplomacy for uh, 15 years as the head of delegation to the Antarctic Treaty meetings and to the uh, CAMELAR, the uh, Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, but I also had uh, the job of leading U.S. government inspections in Antarctica, so I've spent a lot of time uh, going to uh, various uh, national stations and looking at the programs and writing reports about them, and on the uh, northern side, uh, I've spent uh, a fair amount of time working on the Arctic Council in, in particular. Uh, I was um, uh, around when the Arctic Council was, was founded and was able to be the U.S. representative who negotiated the original documents for the um, Arctic Council. So um, I love it when the, there is a forum that is not just one or the other, but is both, because um, I think there are a lot of um, similarities and connections between uh, the two polar regions, and both of them are, are equally uh, interesting. Um, so I'm going to speak about uh, some recent trends uh, in international governance because my background is as a lawyer, so I've spent a lot of time thinking about uh, govern governance and, and geopolitical type issues um, uh, at, at the polls. Um, the, the polls, as you know, have different governance regimes reflecting different uh, ge geographies but there are linkage and similarities as well. So law of the sea uh, and international conventions are important in both places. Um, great power politics uh, play out in both places um, with many of the same actors. Not always the same, but in some cases the same. Um, science is a key ingredient of concern in each place, and we've seen that clearly in the last two um, uh, presentations uh, that we've, we've just uh, viewed. Um, and, of course, the polar regions are all involved with concern with ice and ice-covered waters and how one interacts with, with those places. So first, um, <coughs> excuse me, a few uh, uh, thoughts about the Antarctic. Um, the Antarctic Treaty, uh, signed in 1959 in, in Washington, um, has been overall quite a success. It was a Cold War treaty uh, that was needed given the advance, uh, uh, the, the, the advancing of various claims by, at that point, uh, seven different countries, the possibility that the U.S. and Russia would interpose their own claims if that were uh, uh, deemed uh, politically necessary. Um, and the, uh, it also flowed from um, the scientific work that had taken place in the international geophysical year 
um, that gave the idea of can't Antarctica be a place that is uh, focused on peace and science, and that became the ultimate goal. So these various claims, uh, or territorial claims, were put on hold in favor of science. There was also demilitarization of the, con of the continent. Um, and that has continued uh, rather successfully uh, over these uh, past years. Um, fisheries have been managed under, uh, the, under this organization Camelot that I mentioned before, and that came into uh, place in the 80s. Um, and to the point where I think many people would say that the fisheries are managed in a largely sustainably, uh, largely sustainable way. Not perfectly necessarily, but by and large uh, sustainably um, and in accordance with uh, rules that have been set up under the system. Um, and indeed, uh, in 1986, the, uh, um, excuse me, in, in, sorry, in 2016, the world's largest marine protected area was established in the Ross Sea uh, of Antarctica, twice the size of the state of Texas, huge area, um, and still the benchmark for uh, international MPAs. And one other area of success that um, I'd like to mention is the Ar Article 7 of the Environmental Protocol to the Antarctic Treaty, which um, bans uh, what are called mineral resource activities, meaning, in effect, that there's no mining going on. And that has also worked out quite well. But there are challenges in the Antarctic Treaty system. So, for example, after 2016, there's been a remark, remarked lack of progress when it comes to uh, new uh, marine protected areas and advancing marine conservation. That has, become, uh, that has become particularly difficult because China and Russia in particular have not been interested in continuing the effort to establish a network of marine protected areas. There are also uh, a lot of concerns. I mentioned that, uh, well, on the security side, that there is um, demilitarization, but at the same time, concerns related to dual use of technology and whether some of the stations and their, um, uh, their, their activities um, also are in some way involved in, uh, in, in military uses that, um, that either should be forbidden, are forbidden by the treaty, or would cause some, some difficulty. Now, um, there's also been a rise in the impacts of tourism. So relatively little, limited tourism has turned even this season into uh, more than 100,000 100, people per year visiting um, uh, Antarctica. And the question is, is the level of impact and repetitive impact too great for the ecosystem to, to handle? And is the regulation of tourism adequate at this point? Um, the Antarctic Treaty System operates, as you may know, on the basis of consensus. So it's the consensus of the consultative parties, or in the case of Camelar, of the members. And what that means is it's very difficult to achieve anything new or different, or uh, especially something that has uh, some uh, either controversial uh, or uh, difficult policy basis. So when it comes to actions to protect the environment, 
um, and you want to go farther than cur current efforts, things tend to start to get rather sticky. And so this uh, consensus rule, which has worked pretty well historically, there is at least some question as to um, how the Antarctic Treaty System can continue to be successful with so many parties and certain ones willing to be quite um, uh, limited in, what, in how they're willing to uh, provide for new steps within the treaty system. Now, um, the t there have been tensions, obviously, from the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, and that has been felt in the Antarctic Treaty System. So um, when it comes to reaching agreement on fishing quotas in Camelar, that's becoming more and more difficult, difficult. I mean, the Russians were already hard to negotiate with when it came to these sort of things, and now I think even more so um, in recent years. And certainly the attempt to move forward on marine protected areas has been hurt by uh, the current situation um, with regard to Russian aggression in, in Ukraine. And indeed, uh, there's an, Ukraine has taken over as chair of Camelar at this moment, um, which makes it probably a little more difficult to, for, the, for the chair of Camelar to work with uh, Russia to gain agreement in various ways. Um, so the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting, which is the annual meeting of the Antarctic Treaty Parties, and CAMELAR, which also meets annually, continue to meet with participation by Russia as well as Ukraine. And um, so it isn't quite like the Arctic Council where things have kind of fallen apart. The meetings continue, they're treaty-based, and, and the meetings continue to, to occur, and yet the, there are these certain tensions which make having advancements of policy within these organizations a bit more difficult. So well, now I'll uh, turn to the other poll. Um, there's certainly been a rising importance of the Arctic uh, for the United States and other countries, including non-Arctic states, over the past 20 years. When I started working on the Arctic Council issues originally, back in the 90s, I wouldn't have said, people wouldn't have said, oh, Arctic policy. There is the Arctic policy of the U.S. It just wasn't what people thought. But the importance of the Arctic has risen particularly with the importance of climate change as an issue in international discourse. And so I think uh, uh, it, certainly in the U.S. but in other places, um, understanding the Ar Arctic and a focus on the Arctic is, is more and more important. So this reflects the importance of the climate change issue and the need, the critical need for science that's done there. But also, the, as the ice recedes, new economic uh, opportunities, um, new shipping routes, et cetera, and I think you're all familiar with these factors. Um, so the Arctic had been uh, a place of relative cooperation, building around the Arctic Council in particular, a forum in which some level of productive cooperation with Russia was possible. And so, at least for us in the U.S., we used to talk about the Arctic as a place where you could have productive relations with the Russians and the Council as a relatively productive uh, organization. Well, that's unfortunately not the case anymore. Um, the Russian uh, 
Further invasion of Ukraine has had a major impact on relations, undermining the Arctic Council's work, and stopping science cooperation related to, to Russia. Um, there have been some developments recently that have kick-started the, the, the Council back into some level of activity. So immediately after um, the, the, uh, the further invasion, um, the Arctic Council was put on pause by the seven other countries who are members of the Arctic Council. Recently, the Norwegians have taken over the chairship of the Council um, with the acquiescence of Russia because also for, this, for, the, for the Arctic Council, it operates on the basis of consensus. In this case, the eight states that are the members of the Council. So if it was going to continue, it had to continue with some level of participation um, and agreement by Russia. That was achieved um, earlier this year when the chairmanship transferred to Norway. And in the last few weeks, the Norwegians have worked out, again, working with the Russians as well, um, for some um, new guidelines that will allow working groups to undertake some um, some work. So that means that the pause in the Arctic Council is, has stopped, but it's a very small step because all that's been agreed to is that the working groups can do some work by correspondence. They're not going to meet, at least not yet, um, and decision-making still has to go through all eight of the senior Arctic officials, which means uh, the Russians will be involved, and there's not a full will in all the Arctic states, or any of the Arctic states other than Russia, to work with Russia at this point. So it's a kind of limited step. Um, any event, uh, but the council still exists, uh, which is an important thing, and cooperation uh, still goes on in a number of other contact, uh, contexts. So, for example, bilaterally with respect to fisheries, Norwegians continue to work um, with the Russian fishing, uh, fishing authorities. Um, there is uh, still contacts among the various coast guards in the Arctic, even though they don't have big meetings uh, in their coast guard forum anymore. Um, and also, you may have heard of the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement, which uh, has entered into force as 10 parties, including the EU, including Russia. Um, and it is designed to look at the future of possible uh, fishing in the, Arct in the high seas area of the Arctic Ocean. And it has had uh, two conferences of the parties and has begun its work um, to see whether what the state of knowledge is with respect to fisheries in the, in the high Arctic. So that, that is an area which is moving forward. Um, thinking about a few other uh, trends, um, just mention that, if, as you may realize, that China has rising interests and contacts in, uh, in both uh, polar regions. Um, it is spending rather significant amounts of money on science programs in both places, um, as well as on um, uh, icebreaker support. Um, it's undertaken joint naval exercises with Russia off the coast of Alaska in the Aleutian uh, islands in uh, recent, uh, recent times. Um, so uh, China is not a, a military power in, 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 at either pole, but um, it certainly is more active and is doing it on the basis certainly of long-term planning and funding. So I think that China will be strongly involved in both the Arctic and, and Antarctic uh, for uh, the foreseeable future. 
So, um, uh, another important trend that relates to both uh, poles uh, is the concern in, in societies everywhere with the changing environment uh, in, both, in both places. We've seen record low summer uh, sea ice extent in, in Antarctica, which has been um, in the news in many places. Um, we've seen all sorts of environmental impacts on the Arctic, uh, impacts on infrastructure, uh, uh, changing um, permafrost. Now, all of these are key issues for indig indigenous and local communities um, in the Arctic. Um, and there are uh, attempts to try to work with indigenous peoples and incorporate traditional knowledge into the work of understanding how environmental change is occurring. So it's not just scientists who are uh, looking at these uh, questions, but uh, also the need to take advantage of the, the, the knowledge that people who have lived in these places for millennia uh, possess. So um, I think, uh, in closing, I'd just say that I think that there is a rising interest in the international community as a whole when it comes to the polar regions. And there are so many different countries, whether they are located, located in the relevant region or not, who are able to make a contribution. So it doesn't matter that Estonia is not located in the Arctic or Antarctic, but the scientists of Estonia can, working with uh, other programs, um, go to and do front rank work when it comes to um, um, you know, what's going on in, in those places. And certainly the US is not located anywhere near Antarctica, but we um, invest in the science that's done there. Um, the non-Arctic states are more and more active and whether or not they're observers in the Arctic Council can make a real difference either through the EU or, or otherwise. Any event, um, I think I'll stop there, but uh, thank you very much for inviting me to, to make these remarks. <coughs> Maybe let us do so that at first, please, questions. Sir. What impact has Vladimir uh, Putin had on the scientific programs in the Arctic and the uh, Antarctic? Um, all the, the impact, what is the impact of Vladimir Putin on the scientific programs at both poles. Um, I would say that all of his impacts have been quite negative. Um, in that, the, in the Arctic in particular, um, the need to, uh, for scientists to cooperate uh, in a pan-Arctic sense is often very important to get data that exists in Russia, to have access to data sets, to uh, Russian scientists and knowledge. Um, and Russia makes up half the Arctic. So when Putin uh, uh, causes Russia to behave in this uh, aggressive uh, fashion, and Russia becomes um, uh, on the outs with just about everybody, it cuts off the science, scientific cooperation with the Russians in particular. And I, I don't know any Arctic scientists in the United States who don't think that that has had a profoundly negative impact on work that they're doing. Now, Arctic science continues to be robust in the sense that a lot of science can go on without working with particular Russians 
or being funded by Russia, that sort of thing. So if a scientist at the University of Alaska wants to work with one in Saskatchewan, it can do it. He, he or she can do it. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with Russia. But when you're trying to do certain type of science, particularly climate science, where you have an interest in the region as a whole, um, there are, there are going to be implications. So I think that's a bad thing. With Antarctica, there is a lack of ability within the treaty system to reach agreement on any number of issues related to how, um, how work on climate change in particular can go forward. However, a lot of those programs are more independent from each other. So by and large, the U.S. Antarctic program doesn't depend upon Russian stations and the R Russian efforts in order to get its work done in Antarctica. And of course, it's not a, a, the U.S. can go anywhere in the continent. Russia has no say. It's not like the Arctic, where Russia is now closed to U.S. scientists. So the situation is a bit better in Antarctica, but when it comes to trying to have mutual agreement on marine science programs and, and, and other sort of efforts, those don't go forward quite as, quite as well. So, do you mean the, uh, what the Russians are doing uh, in the Arctic itself, or in terms of science? No, in the Arctic itself. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, uh, as I said, uh, Russia makes up half the Arctic. Um, they have been working hard to promote the Northern Sea Route, for example. Um, they have the uh, more icebreakers than anybody else. Um, I think there, is, there are some people who would say that their military capacity in the Arctic has uh, decreased a bit because of sending assets to Ukraine, but that isn't necessarily a, a permanent situation. Um, I mean, the Arctic will always be important to Russia. Um, and the Arctic maritime space will always be important to, to Russia. So, um, a, for the long, medium, <laughs> near, medium, and longer term, uh, Russia is an important player in the Arctic, just no matter what. So, we have a nice sustainability targets related to both polar areas and then in order to reach these targets we have to have these uh, mutual agreements among the different countries. So what is your feeling about, do we have at this political, geopolitical um, situation any rewarding actions that can be done or we just have to wait better times? So are you talking about the UN sustainable uh, Yeah. Um, sustainable development goals, that, that sort of thing? I mean, more generic that relates to this, and establishing the new protected areas, having a new nice uh, fishery policies, so everything related to sustainability in terms of not only na nature, but also So it's, I think it's hard to make generalizations, but um, Part of the problem in is that uh, it, n not, uh, not everything related to the polar regions and its governance depend upon either the Antarctic Treaty System or the Arctic Council, 
There are broader forms, like the UN Framework Con Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement and the work that goes on, the International Maritime Organization. All of these continue to, um, to function. The Russians are in the room, the Ukrainians are in the room, but the ability to get things done has been decreased. It's not just because of the Ukraine problem, though, at all. So the relationship with China, the U.S. and China and others with China, is, is difficult. The um, tensions between the BRIC countries, uh, and India, and I mean, there are all sorts of things which uh, prevent progress um, and prevent good things from happening. But somehow, the, um, this, this situation of Russian particular ag aggression in Ukraine has cast a pall over out of, out of all of this. And so, if you care about work on climate change, you need, you're concerned about CO2 emissions. Having Russia out of the equation for its territory is a very bad thing. And the conflict causing countries to feel like they have to um, have more, use more coal or more oil or something like that is a really bad thing for nature, for all of us. Um, so it, it, it's not just Ukraine, but it, it makes international relations worse and finding solutions to things uh, just worse. I don't know if that answers, but... Well, I think that things... Uh, it, there is some optimism in that the more the public is educated to some of these problems. Like there, there is, you may have heard of the, um, the, the pledge coming out of the Convention on Biodiversity to protect 30% uh, of the planet by 2030, the so-called 30 by 30 campaign. Um, it's extremely difficult to achieve that, but a lot of governments have signed on to wanting to do that. If you want to protect 30% of the world's ocean, you probably need a lot of Antarctica to be protected. And the reason is that most of the rest of the world's ocean has more um, economic activity, more shipping, which makes the economic costs of putting these regulations in place in those places much more, much, much higher. So trying to cut off fishing and shipping in the Mediterranean is a really hard thing to actually get done. But when it comes to Antarctica, these are huge areas where perhaps you can get, you can make some progress. But um, right now, Russia and China are not on board. Now, I have some hope that one could speak to China in a way that over the next year, two, three, they could be convinced to make some progress. I don't know, but I, I think it's possible. Working with Russia, I think, is not possible right now, given that there's nothing, there's no way for certainly the U.S. to work with them directly on this. So, I don't know. Um, but if, we know, if you take out the Southern Ocean, then you know, where else on the planet, and there's this new biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, high seas treaty that's uh, uh, about to be open for signature, that will create um, some levers that would allow for more marine protected areas. So it'll take time. Do you see any parallels uh, between the climate change which uh, we're uh, experiencing right now and what was in, in Greenland 
uh, a thousand or two thousand years ago. Do you see any parallels uh, in 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 the in the situations? Uh, which work like this? Yeah, you mean the Viking Age warming and and why Greenland is Greenland? Uh, yes, definitely, it's possible. And as far as I know, nowadays is uh, very nice satellite-based uh, systems which observe the changes in Arctic and everywhere else, say that they can see already this constant greening, which is a sign that, uh, that it, it should, or it is already started, it has already started. Um, as far as I know, from Greenland, they have not yet reported really a kind of land cover change comparable to that what uh, the Vikings have been describing. Uh, but there is always in ecosystem change, there is always this uh, kind of time lag from the point where climate is ready to the point when actually vegetation migrates in and starts to, to uh, flourish. So it is possible that the climate is already there, just vegetation has not been reaching the same place. It's interesting to mention that among us there is one Estonian researcher who works in Antarctica but in, together with Finland. Now the Jonne Kota was with Chile and uh, uh, Britt Tisler, he has the experience is also to be the leader of the polar station in Antarctica. So would you like to comment a little bit? Thank you, Catherine, very much. And thank you, Ivan, for a very nice talk. Yes, well, I have been already several times in Antarctica, and this season is going to be tense on the ice. I'm preparing and leaving in the mid of December. I've been also in Antarctica as well, working on drifting ice, but it's a completely different story. Uh, actually, I have one question or comment to Ivan as well, because Considering the international situation, what is right now, we are all here, and we all know that so far a lot of Antarctic logistics was based on the help and Russian logistics. There are planes, Illusion 76, a lot of them, there are icebreakers, Treshnikov, etc., etc., uh, flying and uh, shipping <laughs> to south and back. and. Uh, their uh, war in Ukraine has had impact for sure for this logistics as well. I am feeling that every day. And um, so far on the big and rich countries, it's not big issue for UK, US, they have ships, they have planes to take cargo, take people to the south and back. Interestingly, even Ukraine, it's Vernatsky station running 365, there are people working and they have own ship, <laughs> taking people there and cargo fuel, etc. Yeah. But for small countries, uh, particularly with bases in the middle of nowhere, inland, it's very big problem, particularly in Dronning Moorland, where I am working. Yeah. And so far we have used this gateway, maybe you know, company ALC, ALC. It's yes. not anymore ALC, it's a completely different name. Com Completely, probably different people, but still. <laughs> uh, they are running uh, planes, illusions, and they are flying to Novolazarsk. It's under the Russian permits, as far as I know. And it's not nice to play by those rules anymore. Mm. And this, as already mentioned, it's a problem for small countries in like Finland, Sweden, 
Um, so far, uh, also it was also Germany partly, not talking about India, but also Japan or Drumland countries actually. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, for Finland it was uh, found solution. Last season we are used um, planes and uh, logistics provided by Norway. We more or less directly took a flight from Oslo to Norwegian station Troll and further with feeder flights. It's uh, it's which was quite okay, not bad, but of course it's not very the most elegant way to run this kind of business. And, and I have been several times in Comrade meetings as well. I am deputy manager of Finnish National Antarctic Program, and, and people, of course, they are discussing this kind of issues on the floor, on the tete a tete. But of course, everybody tries to be polite. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, uh, this is uh, how to say, the atmosphere in, uh, in Antarctic Treaty meetings as well. It was Helsinki recently. And, uh, well, what is your opinion and uh, point of view Rob, from this uh, uh, very practical <coughs> point of view in order to take this uh, lot of cargo, fuel and waste back mm. to, to, in our case, um, Cape Town and it is not very easy to handle this kind of things. Thank you, Ivan. So, uh, thank you. I, I, I think you've, uh, uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I've gone through South Africa uh, using what was Alsi uh, to, uh, with the Russians, to go to Novo, to go to Maitri, to go to Troll, to all of this. And the Dromland network was set up as a way of making it possible for all of these different uh, countries, including ones with more limited budgets, to be able to work together. Now, when the Russians are playing nice, then using those sort of assets through country companies that are controlled by them, I mean, that's the thing, uh, works relatively well. They're professional companies and they, I've taken those uh, flights to Novo and, you know, I lived, it's okay. Um, but when uh, we get into a political situation like this, it's much more difficult. So I have, my understanding is that Norwegians and others had tried to step in to uh, take up some of the slack and we're looking for ways to, alternative ways. Um, but uh, finding that quickly or easily in, in a cost-effective way is very hard because there are only certain types of planes available and uh, these Russians were operating, uh, you know, in this, in this way, including using Novo as a, you know, in the landing uh, strip as a way of getting to other sort of places. So I have actually very little to add to what you've said, but I think that there are uh, people in Comnap who are wondering, so we don't have to rely on this, what else can we do to get to, it's, it's an East Antarctic problem. The peninsula is, is a different situation, right? And McMurdo is different, and uh, the Australians can get in and out of their uh, um, stations. So, yeah, that 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 is, uh, you know, a, cu a current problem that the Comnat group is looking at, right? Well, yes. Uh, we are using, okay, Germany has a very nice iceberg, a polar stern, and, and we are using almost every year uh, in order to just send some cargo, some containers, and some other countries as well, who are also mm, just taking some other cargo ships, and it's not very big problem to put just one or two containers to the ship, but the problem is that the ships arriving beginning of January <laughs> to the coast 
and in order to take the cargo to our stations by planes, small planes, twin otters or, or DC-3, it's, it's, it's typically quite late already and in order to just run some scientific programs. But yes, that's, that's our life, I am struggling and <laughs> every day and that's, but yeah, let's see how it's turning out. And yeah, I mean, there may be other countries with ships that could step up and, and, uh, and help in certain ways. Um, Chinese are increasing their capacity. Maybe they'd like to <laughs> help a bit. I don't know. But it really does have to be the, the, the countries that are used to working in the East Antarctic area, right? So that, that they will um, be used to um, expeditions in, you know, that that uh, that part. Um, I wish you every luck and figure that out. <laughs> it's going to be quite short. It's only two and a half months this summer. It's just the summer, and it's not very big problem. But yes, anyway. All the polar researchers in Estonia, when they started, the starting point was not in Tallinn, it was here, in Tartu, and more exactly in Turavere. And uh, there was a very strong group of uh, researchers who, through the ten years, did the research work in Antarctica. Uh, and, uh, yeah, one of them is left only, you know, this group because it's, they started already in the, uh, in the 60s, early 60s. But here is one scientist here who maybe would like to say some comments. Hi, I'm Merko Jakobson. And, uh, I started Arctic uh, research in 2006. And uh, then we had problems with Russians already. <laughs> because the agreement was, yeah, was done, but uh, they said, no, we don't want you to do measurements in international waters near the Russia. Yeah, but finally we yeah, were able to do some measurements. But yeah, but luckily now I'm working just on models, so. <coughs> so which, which international waters near uh, uh, Russia? Yeah, yeah Russia. Where? Uh, uh, near, near North Pole, but okay. uh, Russian side. Okay. So it was, yeah. But yeah, now I'm working with models. So, and uh, even, even not, not very much about the Arctic, but uh, just Estonia. But yeah, working with Arctic was interesting and I'd like to do more, but yeah, no funding. Mm. It reminds me of uh, something you say, which is, uh, uh, might be interesting, is that when I and a Russian counterpart led the negotiation for the science cooperation treaty that was negotiated under the uh, Arctic Council, and which is now in force. It's not working very well right now, but nevertheless, it was something that the US and Russia wanted very much. One of the reasons that the US wanted it is, uh, as you may know, under law of the sea, if you want to do marine scientific research in the easy of a, uh, of a member of uh, UNCLOS, you have to get permission. And normally, for the U.S., we routinely grant permission. Most uh, states routinely grant permission. But Russia would usually say no, including to the U.S., which meant that our researchers who really wanted to get into and see uh, to do research in these areas couldn't do it. So we fought hard for a provision in that treaty that speaks to a procedure for being able to request uh, MSR clearance, Marine Scientific Research clearance. And the purpose of do putting that in there, excuse me, was to make it 
slightly more likely that the Russians would respond to our request to let us into those waters. And so they, uh, they, don't, always, they don't always say no, but they send, say no a fair amount. Now, these days, post-Ukraine crisis, there's no hope that they would say yes, certainly to a U.S. request. Maybe to a Chinese request, they say yes, but to a U.S. request, they'll say no. Um, but the desire for us to do MSR with, you know, near Russia in the Arctic was very strong for U.S. scientists and U.S. Uh, agencies like the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. You know, here in Tartu, it's a very strong group of ethnologists and experts concerning the research work about the Nordic people. So, please. My name is Art Lete. I'm a professor of ethnology, and um, we established here recently a center of Arctic studies as well. It's for humanities, mostly. And uh, our uh, primary field has been like this Siberia and Russian North. And we have studied from the 90s already, uh, from the very end of the Soviet time even. But uh, now, of course, everything has changed really a lot. Uh, actually, uh, it changed for us already during this uh, COVID pandemic when we couldn't travel. Uh, as there were special restrictions for Baltic states uh, that were uh, explained officially through pandemic, but uh, the other European citizens could travel to Russia, but not us, and now the war. And um, so we basically don't travel now for a few years. And um, uh, perhaps this um, um, estimation is that um, it doesn't happen soon, if, if ever, during our career. But, um, um, okay, as we are studying people, these indigenous um, groups in the north, there are also alternative ways, actually, as um, internet still works, phones, um, you have at least some public media, some databases, you can, this uh, social media. Um, you, it seems like you can, but actually this situation is changing to the earth all the time. And even in the beginning of, uh, uh, of the previous year, when, when the active phase of this uh, war in Ukraine started, we um, couldn't imagine how it actually goes, that what uh, security police controls over the social media and what is possible, what's not possible, uh, even any kind of communication. <laughs> Uh, it's very complicated. So we are actually working on this methodology, how to reach out to them yeah. in the way that don't uh, harm them. Uh, okay, it's also not uh, under our control. They can be harmed even if we don't do anything, just because they know us. It was like in Soviet times, that in, in the 30s, like uh, hundreds of... Um, of indigenous scholars were killed just because they had had contacts with Estonians or Finns or somebody. Um, so you never know. So it is quite tough, but somehow we, there are some patterns appear and we try to work out. Basically we are trying to adapt to this situation if you must study from a long distance. Uh, so, and we, we don't abandon these studies, but as these field studies were really the basics of our research, so it's a um, big blow, but um, um, they even in, 
invite that technically it's possible to travel and I even get like invitations, come here, come here. Yeah. Okay, but I'm also head of the institute. I can't uh, give this kind of example to my scholars that, okay, uh, maybe it's okay. Maybe I can outsmart the security police there or something. Uh, it's very naive hope. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I understand the, the concerns uh, you raise, and I mean, in the U.S., in a slightly different sort of situation, the, I mentioned that the U.S. government has not uh, issued any guidance saying that uh, American sci private scientists or university scientists can't work with Russian counterparts. It's for government, scientists, you can't do it. But for others, it's left to their discretion. But there are these remaining concerns, right? Are, are you going to get involved with people who are carrying out a mandate from the central government? And what does that mean? And is there a danger of, if let's say you have a uh, a friend of a scientist who you worked with for years and who you trust, could you be not doing them a favor of being in contact with them because it's held against them that some American is, you know, trying to contact them? You know, we live in a world where, you know, you know, bad things happen as a result of associations. So. Um, it's one of the very difficult things, but you know, there, we're often getting these questions in the U.S. Oh, you know, science is pure, and people ought to be able to work with each other. Why can't they? Well, in some cases, they can't. You can, but it also can prove dangerous to to them, uh, and you just have to be very careful about about what you're doing. Sure, it's very easy to overestimate your smartness in dealing with these issues, but um, yeah, this situation is not under our control anyway. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, here in the back row is one girl, <laughs> Maria Hunzar, who lives and studies actually in uh, Svalbard. And uh, now you are writing already your final thesis, yeah? but maybe you will have some comments. Um, yeah, it's kind of, it's not really related to what we're talking about, but uh, um, I'm, yeah, I'm studying and living in Svalbard and studying biology there. And I was one of the students that was on the first polar quiz we had, uh, so I kind of started studying afterwards. And it's actually really interesting to see if the last few years there's been more Estonian students also coming. So usually I'm not, well, the last few years I haven't been the only one studying there. So we have both scientists working there, but there's also Estonian exchange students coming up there, which is really cool to see that there's more people being interested in it. Svalbard is a wonderful place, so I think you're very lucky to be able to be studying there. Okay, it seems that uh, there are no more comments, remarks, questions. So what else can we say then? Thank you very much for coming, for talking, for discussions. Thank you. Thank you.